Good morning, Pleasant Grove. Welcome back to another Sunday worship service. We're going to read together this morning. As soon as it comes up on the screen, so I'm going to ask you to stand, all who are able. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed, persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed. As you gave them strength to fight, give us power to break the chains of mass incarceration, poverty, violence, and the sins that so easily beset. As we gather for worship, we remember the sacrifices and faith of these great and women. Guide our feet, focus our minds, and sustain our hearts as we strive to serve this present age in unity and brotherhood, amen. Thank you. Good morning, good morning, good morning to each and every one of you here in the sanctuary and those of you who are online who have tuned in to us at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church here in Springfield, Illinois. We welcome you. Now the choir has a special song for you.
Thank you, thank you, thank you, choir. Let's give them a hand. It's our men's choir today. As we continue on service, um, now we will have our psalm reading. And I will be coming from Psalms 18, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 19 through 29. Once again, that is Psalms 118, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 19 through 29. And it reads as thus. Give thanks to Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let all Israel repeat, his faithful love endures forever. Then we'll jump down to 19 through 29. Open for me the gates where righteousness enters, and I will go in and thank the Lord. These gates are to are lead to the presence of the Lord, and the godly enter there. I thank you for answering my prayer and giving me victory. The stone that the builders rejected has now become cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is a wonderful thing to see. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Please, Lord, save us. Please, Lord, give us success. Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, shining upon us. Take the sacrifice and bind it with cords on the altar. You are my God, I will praise you. You are my God, I will exhaust you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his holy and righteous word. Word. Our prayer list is as follows. Ali Upshaw, Donnie Sykes and family, Ermia Lester and family, Foreman family, James and Charlene Les Lanier, Jonathan Lewis, Laverne Pritchard, Leroy Williams and family, Patricia Lester, Pierre, Percy, Lisa, and Xavier Crawford, Strong family, Tyvin and Araya Garrison, Van Warren, Teresa Haley, Bowen family, Renita Robinson, Cornell Bowden, Bird family, Doris Merrifield, William Robinson family, Betty Work, Jean Johnson, Johnny Murphy, Morales Mix Jr. and Sr., Eloise Chandler Wade, Ron Gibbs, Marjorie Barnes, Edward Ross family, Pastor Melvin C. Charles, Eddie Smith, Michael and Doris Williams, Robert Davis, Jacoby and Jamari Jacobs, Betsy Hurston family, Donna Taylor, Bill Crawford and family, Sabri Jones, Jean Norman, Kieran Madison, Teresa Hatchett, Jerome and Teresa Henderson, Stephen Everett Madison, John Perrett, Warren Glover family, William Grant, Price family, Chad Woods and Lee family, Dorothy Tillman and Kat Washington. That's our list that has been submitted to us and that doesn't mean that there's not others who have a desire to be on here and, and for one reason or other didn't get to contact us or just didn't want to put their name on her, but we know that each and every one of us needs some type of prayer. So we thank the Lord for being there for us. So please join me in prayer now. Most holy and wise and everlasting Father, it is once again that you have graced us with your mercy and allowed us to get up this morning to come to this house of worship or even join us online. It's with your grace and mercy that you allow us to even get up and know who we are and knows who we are, that we be in our right mind, Father God, to be able to do the things that we can do, to get up and take care of ourselves, to dress ourselves, to come here to church, to be able to interact and fellowship and worship with each and, other, each and every one of us. We thank you for it, Father God. We thank you for just having us to grace and your Holy Spirit to increase. Because, Father, when your Holy Spirit fills us, we know that he will guide us in the way that we should be guided. We put our own self aside. We take a back seat and allow him to show us what it is that you would have us to do. And as we continue in this worship service, Father God, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for the choir. We want to thank you for the preach word that's going to be brought forth by our Reverend Rosser. 
whatever you have put on his heart and mind, that we will take it and we will meditate upon it. And we will share it first with ourselves and then we'll share it with others, Father God. And then there may be some soul that say, what must I do to be saved? And they will come forth, Father God, giving their life to Christ to be part of this band of believers and to become a disciples in which we know that that's what it is. We're supposed to go forth and make disciples. And that's what we are commissioned here to do at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church, Father God. And we want to thank you for it. We want to thank you just for to continue throughout this service. And we want to uplift and worship your holy and righteous name. For it's in Jesus the Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.
going to put this out there. We need some more men to join us in the choir so that I can sit down. Amen. All these brothers out here got voices. If you can't sing, make a joyful noise. I'm just saying. If we needed a sixth man for our basketball team, I guarantee you we'd have 15 of them. But I want to encourage our men to come on in. Come on in this house, as we say. Let us pray. And now, God, we thank you for another time, another place, even another season where we begin to focus ourselves on the work that Jesus Christ did. And God, as we today on Palm Sunday, remember, remember, and remember again what he did and how he did. God, give us a fresh understanding. Give us a new look into that wonderful, glorious day. Now, God, bless each heart that is in this room and those that are watching online. Hear our prayers. Grant those that are in your will. Move us in right directions. God, anoint each person with a measure of your mercy and your grace. Now, unstop deep ears. Open up hardened hearts. And allow the words that flow from my mouth today will have the devil horrified, your people edified, but you, God, will be glorified. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. I'm going to call your attention today to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, beginning with the seventh verse, if you don't mind standing with me. Mark chapter 11, verses 7 through 11. Let's read those verses together if we could. Let's read. Then the disciples. Amen. While you're standing, just want to say this with me if you would. Which one, Which one will, you choose? will you choose? Thank you so much. You may be seated today. To this male chorus singing out of their hearts today. And, and, and a lot of us are battling these sinuses. We, we've been clearing frogs out of throat. I don't think it was this many frogs. When God sent the plague, I don't think it was this many frogs. I honestly don't. Uh, to these deacons that are serving today, filling in the, the gap while the rest of us serve in the choir. And of course, to our own Minister Warren over here and Reverend Davis in the choir. Everybody in the choir, come think of it. <laughs> of course, to all you ushers, thank you so much. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Um, this is Palm Sunday, and now we're getting into the Easter spirit, if you will. This time, bring me down a little bit. This time every year, we gather in the spaces of worship, and just like at Christmas time, we're ready to hear the story, the story of how Jesus finally decides to come from obscurity and publicly announce his position and his purpose. He finally can let it be known that, yes, he healed all of those folks. Yes, he has cast out demons. Not long ago, blind Bartimaeus called out when he was, when, when he was walking down the road. And whether he was accurate or slightly off, blind Bartimaeus called Jesus son of David. This is a name that is more of a political descriptor than a theological descriptor. But in using that title, I wonder, did Bartimaeus desire the kingdom of David or the kingdom of God? Because later 
he would receive his sight if he was after the kingdom of God. Nevertheless, and always the more, Jesus heals him. And now, now this, and now on this Sunday, as we subtitle it Palm Sunday, the prophecy of Zechariah 9 and 9 is fulfilled in our hearing. Rejoice, O Israel, and rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous, and victorious, yet he is humble, riding a donkey, riding a donkey's coat. As the people shouted and spread their garments all in his path, setting up sort of a red carpet experience for Jesus. Jesus, sure enough, comes through the gates, and he's riding brand spanking new, fresh, never before ridden donkey. All the people shouting, not save us from our sins, but instead they're shouting, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Not save our sins. Blessings on the coming kingdom of David. The people are shouting a covert and veiled affirmation of an overthrow, of a current emperor and ruler and replacement of Jesus as the son of David. And as their new ruler, they want Jesus to come in and make changes. They want Jesus not to save their souls, not to forgive their sins, but they want Jesus to come in and be the new ruler. They're saying that Jesus will save them from Rome, not from sin and evil. They're shouting for an end to the tyranny and an end to the monarchy that has existed. Jesus is their new king. Jesus is their new emperor. And they're saying it is with God's blessing. And as they say in baseball, swing and a miss. When they say blessed on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, it is literally saying Jesus is coming with God's affirmation, with God's blessing, with God's approval. They are looking for a political leader, not a change or a shift in the atmosphere. But we can't be too hard on the crowds. After all, they followed Jesus all over the place and nothing seemingly was getting better. Our Alan Culpepper says, Jesus' procession was rather unimpressive and pitiful. It was filled with Galileans. It was filled with fishermen and beggars. It was filled with women. It was filled with healed people. And there was a Messiah, a Messiah riding a donkey, calling out for God's deliverance, calling for a kingdom of their ancestor David. They were wishing for times of old. I got to feel sorry for them because as Jesus says, they know not what they do. Nevertheless, the entry on the donkey is impressive because no one entered Jerusalem, entered the Jerusalem gates mounted on a beast. When you came in, you had to dismount and walk your donkey in, but Jesus stays on the donkey. He enters Jerusalem on the beast. Nobody but the prelate or the emperor himself could ride in on anything, but here Jesus comes in, defying all the rules. And speaking of which, on that beautiful spring day in that first century Palestinian air, 3033 CE, or AD as we call it today, a powerful leader of Jerusalem providence entering on the opposite end of town. There's another procession that we know little about, but it's entering Jerusalem, uh, and it's none other than Pontius Pilate with his entourage all around him. Pilate, like most governors before him, lived in a splendid city near the coast in a magnificent home. He didn't stay in the capital. He stayed in Chicago. I'm sorry. <laughs> Freudian slip there. He stayed on a location called Caesarea Martina or Caesarea on the sea. He loved the weather. It was tropical. It wasn't as hot as it is in Jerusalem. It wasn't stuffy. And most of all, it wasn't a capital city. 
He was able to avoid the partisan politics that went on. He was able to avoid the violence that was inevitable. He was able to be there and be the ruler and be cool. Pilate mainly came to Jerusalem during Jewish festivals, not because he was a good Jew, don't get it twisted, but he came because he represented law and order. He represented power, and he came to flex his judicial and his governor muscles to display and enforce power because in case these Jews get out of line, I've got something to do with them. After all, brothers and sisters, he was the personification of Pax Romana, that is the peace of Rome, which is synonymous for peace peace, expansion, imperialism, relative peace, and most of all, law and order. Pax Romana meant make Rome great again. It was led by a tyrannical ruler who circumvented the law every chance he got for the sake of political and judicial expediency. He didn't care, and Pilate was his tool in Jerusalem to get it done. If there were payoffs to be made, you pay them. If there was free labor to be had, Rome took full advantage of it all. And not, but not another person could come in and be rich because of the tax breaks that all of the rulers were getting, all of the handshakes and backslapping. The rich stepped on the poor, and their primary job was to keep them subservient. People were placed in holding cells. Children were separated from their parents. Pax Romana meant that Calvary was created because examples needed to be made of those who protested and those who spoke against Pax Romana or much less the imperial monarchy. Because if you weren't a Roman and you weren't rich, you were nothing. You weren't fit to even walk on. They would kick you out of the city and walk around. But you were not fit to be anything but crucified. Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, had come. Pax Romana was in place. Make Rome great again. And the Romans, they were poor. The poor Romans, they believed with all their heart in this idea of trickle-down economics, that if we keep the rich rich, they'll give us some too. They believed it because their God, Caesar Augustus, told them. Caesar told them they would be rich eventually. And why not? Caesar Augustus came from money. His daddy was rich. He was the supreme ruler and the son of God. Let me explain that because in Roman imperial theology, which was founded far, far before Caesar ascended to the throne, he was the benefactor of this thing called imperialism. Imperialism said that Caesar, whomever he was, was viewed as God, and Pilate, by attachment, was viewed as his disciple. And since he was God, everyone after him was the son of God, and therefore everybody viewed Caesar as God. But Pilate, good old Pilate, he entered Jerusalem on his parade. Unlike Jesus' entry, the people remained silent as he walked by. There was no shouting, no proclaiming God, no shouts of Hosanna, Lord save us now. Instead, it was quiet. It was still. A cavalry of horses, not a donkey. A cavalry of horses came first. Pilate riding in his chariot, looking out with his nose turned up. Stirring the first century dust and dirt. Foot soldiers were marching in their whole armor. Banners waving in the air, in the warm Palestinian air. Golden eagles could be seen glistening in the sun, polished so clear you could just about see yourself in them. Mounted on poles high, so for miles you could see that the governor was coming. There were reflections and sparkles from the sun's rays bouncing off the metal and the gold that was on the soldier's uniform. There was a sound of feet stepping. Horses, bridles, and bits in their mouths were clinking as they walked. And of course, every hero, every hero has to have theme music. 
So Pilate had his drum corps walking in front. Coach Prime wasn't the first one to have theme music. The drum major would raise his staff, and the people all around would look, and the squad would begin beating their drums, setting the pace for the parade as they entered Jerusalem, beating the drums, signifying that royalty was approaching. And the people, the Romans, some of them Galileans, they stood, some of them in awe, some of them stood in resentment, some of them in protest. Some of them stood just simply in silence. Still others were cowering, but they were curious as Pontius Pilate came into the city. But everyone realizing that the governor being in the city, things were going to change. Things that used to happen could not happen again now because he's here. Pontius Pilate is in the area, so we can't do what we've always done. What a sight to see as this governor enters the place. You know, Jesus arrived and went into the temple at the end of his parade, and everybody was gone. It was the end of the day. Uh, Business was finished. Everybody had gone home. Uh, kind of an anticlimactic entrance, if you will, to the end of a gaggle of followers raising all kinds of praise. But something struck me as I looked at that about these, these two processionals as these two parades went into the city. Depending on where you were in that setting determined your theology. I said something there. Watch out. I said something about where your belief was, and how your politic was expressed. In this year of our Lord, 20 and 24, I challenge you to examine where you are, and if you were in that first century setting, which parade would you be at? I believe the United States of America is confused today because we're attending the wrong parade. Too many of our friends, too many of our kin, they're at the wrong parade. And we and they are attending processions where foul and despicable things are being stated in rallies without care. The parade where only the noise is heard from the echo chamber. People are drinking their own Kool-Aid. They're trying to get you to drink the Kool-Aid with them. We're Hispanics. Parades and rallies where Hispanics and Haitians and other people who are darker hue are not welcome. They're turned away and told, there's no room for you here. It doesn't matter if you're escaping persecution or you're escaping violence from the land that you came from. We're not the police of the dark-skinned people, just the light-skinned world. We don't go into those you know what countries, but we like countries that have lighter skin, lighter complected people. We're attending the parade where the floats that go by are nothing more than religious relics of evangelical leaders that are trying to push an agenda and get richer and get richer. And they're preaching to and they're being preached to by extremist politicians who farm hate and harvest violence and they push war and they water it with war because like in the first century the high priests the big time preachers were at the top of the economic system and their perceived job was not spreading the gospel to all the people but instead they were keeping their nest feathered they were keeping the poor begging so I ask you again Pleasant Grove which which parade would you be attending are you at the parade that has a king portrayed as a proletarian hero, a fighter for the working man and the working woman, a parade that has all the trappings of monarchy set on killing and abolishing law-abiding structures, even killing democracy? Are you in the parade that embodies a self a self-empowered to inflict their will on everything and everybody? The people are saying, let's make the streets bloody if our way is not had. Maybe you're in the other parade where a lowly king is ushered in, 
while the people lay their garments in the way, shouting their praises of the king who will not save them, but will take them over the top, who will give them their 40 acres and a mule, who wants him to be the ruler, who wants to tear down government systems and restore the house of David. People shouting, this is the one. But God, save us. But God, bless our country and our mess. Religious people, but no idea of what spirituality means. Good religious people, but they have no idea why the Messiah came. They got the right leader, but they got the wrong assumptions. We're in a quagmire. But let me propose today a third option, a third parade, if you will, where people recognize that freedom is not found in the big buildings and in the big budgets and the summer retreat homes that sit on the coast. That a a parade where the people avoid the iconoclastic temples and the cathedrals that are populated by cultic members preaching racial diatribes and ethnic epitaphs, but instead a community where love is the focus by the committed that are attending there. A committed, a community where there are those who accept people that don't look like them and don't sound like them and don't dress like them and don't live like them and All of that that we expect, but they are recognized as the images made in the image of God. A place where love speaks louder than any microphone or any megaphone. And love comes from a place where we recognize that we're all different. And we will love you and we will nurture you and support you while God is working on both of us. Don't you want to be a part of a community, a place where love is is not just a four-letter word, but we love one another and we recognize our failings and our fallings and our freckles and we still love you anyway? See, at this parade that I'm talking about, we celebrate the fact that God saw humanity on life support and God sent the divine son to give a blood transfusion by way of the cross. And we can in earnest shout, Hosanna, God save us now. A love in a community of people that knows that the cross and the pain of death And resurrection and entering new life is to die to the old life. But most important, this is a parade that realizes that at the end of the parade, where our Savior rode into town on a new colt, he is riding into a painful, horrible crucifixion. Understand that at the end of Jesus' parade into Jerusalem lies death. And suffering. It's not a party. Jesus is riding to his death. And here's the thing we have to ride into our death as well. We've got to accept the cross that is made for us. All of us have a cross. We've got to die to something. It might be pride. It might be righteous indignation. It might be a spirit that is in you that is keeping you from moving to the next level. Pleasant Grove, I have accepted my cross. Have you? I've decided which parade I'm going to attend. Have you? I have decided to travel with Jesus. Have you? I've decided on long time ago. Which side of the fence I'm going to sit on. You won't find me with big leaders and big time politicians. But you'll find me working with the people because that's where my Jesus was. Which parade are you going to attend? Which side of town are you going to be on? Who is going to be your God? Doors of the church are open. As we stand all through the building today. Jesus calls us.
to salvation. But salvation requires something of us. Love. Love is what's called and required of us. And if you don't have love in your heart, you're at the wrong parade. Professor Grove, we've got to have more love. Stevie Wonder's put a song out said, love's in need of love today. Send yours in. When? Right away. We need love. Most of the problems we've got today is because we don't love or we confuse love or we switch bait love. It's this, but it's not that. It's here, but it's not there. Love. That's why Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a brand new donkey. As our male chorus sings, won't you come? Accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Believe that he is the Son of God, that he died for your sins. Confess that truth. Not, you don't have to do it in front of everybody. Confess that truth in my ear. You can be saved right now. You may be looking for a church home today. I offer Pleasant Grove to you. Make your way down to one of these front pews, and we will welcome you home on today. Won't you come? Praise God. Praise God. Just a couple of announcements, and then we will prepare for our tithes and offering. Don't forget this Saturday, March 30th, from 11 to 1. We still need a few volunteers for our Easter egg hunt, so we need you to see Kay and Jackie to sign up after service in the foyer. 
If you're volunteering, please be at the church by 9 a.m. to help set up. In other words, we need some egg hiders and some children watchers because we want to make sure we keep our babies safe. Amen? So y'all, y'all, and these are not eggs you can eat, so don't be getting excited. Uh, but yes, we, we do need assistance, so if you would, see them right after service. Wave your hand. <laughs> and uh, see them after service. Let them know that you'll be there. And then be here at 9 a.m. on Saturday. Amen. Amen. Easter service, sunrise service on next Sunday will begin at 7 a.m. 7 a.m. Breakfast will be immediately ser- will be served immediately after the preaching is done and the benediction is given. We're going to go over to the Hubbard building like we do so many years before, and we're going to have a spread. We're going to have some eggs, some bacon, some sausage, some biscuits. Hash browns. What you say? No, we ain't got no grits. We, this ain't the South. Folks, folks in the North don't cook grits right, so we ain't doing that. We ain't doing that. <laughs> but we are going to enjoy fellowship with one another. And then, and then the children's program will begin at 9 a.m., so we're going to listen to our babies and our young people give us Easter. Amen? Give them a hand. And I'm, I'm anxious to hear some of these speeches that, that have been handed out to them and these parents that have been working with them. And I'm expecting, fully expecting our next drama person to come from out of this group because they're going to come forward and they're going to put their hand on their hip and they're going to declare Jesus and then they're going to walk off to the side. So get ready for it. Nine o'clock. If you can't make the seven o'clock, be here at nine o'clock to support these babies and bring somebody with you. Amen. Uh, the PCB... The, the Pleasant Grove sweatshirts, T-shirts, if you order them recently, the long sleeve ones, they are in and they're ready for pickup. Need you to see Kathy Davis immediately after service. Uh, she'll be back in the office. If you have not paid, bring your payment. Um, and if you forgot it, go get it and bring it back. Uh, it's, it's COD, cash on delivery. Amen. All right. We do have a few extras available, so if you didn't order one, go see Kathy, and she'll have, I'm sure we've got several different sizes that she'll be able to give you one. I mean, put your, put your Pleasant Grove shirt on, some P- PGBC pride, and walk around the city boldly with your patch on. Amen? Uh, now, don't be in the club. Don't be all up in the liquor store flossing. Don't, you, know, you know what? Don't be in the dispensary with your Pleasant Grove T-shirt on. My dad would say, word to the wise is sufficient. That's all I'm going to say about that right there. Amen. Malachi 3 and 10 says, bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house, says the Lord of hosts. And try me if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you will not have room enough to receive it. Was anybody hungry on last night? Was anybody cold last night? Not because you wouldn't turn the heat on, but because you could not turn the heat on. Did anybody not make it here safely today? God is pouring out blessings, and you can't receive all of it. Speaking of blessings, we had a wonderful time last night. I want to thank Professor Ezra Casey and the choir for giving and all of the soloists and all of the performers and narrators. Y'all did an outstanding job on last night. We were blessed. And I am excited about what Pleasant Grove is doing. Amen? Amen. All right. We got our ushers ready. Y'all ready? You ready? All right. Let us stand.
Yes, yes, let's all stand and prepare to be dismissed and offer up a prayer to God and his son, Jesus Christ, who come highly recommended. Let's bow our heads. Eternal God, our fathers, we prepare to leave this place. We ask right now that you receive the offering and, and that have been brought to you today, the tithes and offerings, Lord God, that they be used to build your kingdom, bless the hearts and minds of all those who gave today and those who are positioning themselves to give in the future, Lord God. We thank you for the sermon today. We thank you for those who came seeking and pray that they leave having found what they needed, Lord God. And as we leave here, we pray a special blessing on the households that are represented, Lord God. Keep them and hold them until we're able to come back together in a bond of love. And now, Lord God, may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest and rule and abide with each of us henceforth now and forevermore and let the church say Amen.